Let me introduce Etienne here. Um, so this week, as you know, we want to focus very much on combining sort of a system level perspective on the brain, but also in particular look at how we can think about the brain in states of disease or in states of recovery. Okay, so that also means you have to think about these underlying organizational principles. And for that, Etienne is the right man. So Etienne Bourdais is, is uh, working in London. And Etienne is in a very unique position, sort of in between understanding and studying the motor system, but also linking that to the field of robotics and, and artificial systems. So that means he has a very unique, also control-oriented perspective on how motor systems are organized, can be understood in health and disease, but also can be synthesized. So it's a very unique multidisciplinary perspective on these really complex questions of, of motor control. So, Etienne, it's great that you're here. Welcome, and I'm looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much. So I'm very happy to be here, and I hope uh, I will provide something that you don't know. Uh, I have to say something. I'm not biting, so if you want to come closer, you can. <laughs> so, yeah. But there were times that you did. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so first, uh, a very few slides about uh, what we do. So, okay, so what we do, I, I call it uh, robot, it's human robotics. Human robotics meaning uh, that we use techniques from robotics to investigate, to try to understand human sensory motor control, how we manipulate objects, how we interact with the environment, and so on. On the other hand, we, we developed robot to help humans. So that's, that's what I put under this umbrella of um, human robotics. And uh, okay, so you have seen this video. So this is a, a robotic wheelchair with a, a cerebr cerebral palsy um, guy, and and he has the hand that is oscillating widely, so he cannot use a, a conventional uh, motorized wheelchair. And and when you see that, you think, oh, Google car, okay? So Google car. Um, however, it's just the converse then of Google Car because, in fact, so, so I've seen this in several projects. Um, so people developed a mobile robot, basically, that is able to recognize the environment, to, to find out where to go, and so on. And after two years, they try with any of this uh, end user. And basically, they are not happy because they want to drive. Right, so it's the converse of the Google car. And, and I'm coming to the point that I think what is really important and what I'm uh, basically interested in is uh, human machine interaction. So how to make that, in this case, uh, the user can drive and can, uh, can steer as much as he can while the system is providing just the assistance that is needed. Okay, so, uh, so I, I I grew up in Switzerland. I did study at ETH. After I was in, uh, it was a postdoc in Canada, in Japan, in uh, in Chicago. After I was five years in Singapore, and and now I'm for I'm for 13 years uh, in in London. And these are some of the people along the way, and I, I still collaborate with uh, many of them. And, and of course, some of the material I will present is with them. So this, this is important to note. Um, yeah, so my main interest is human-machine interaction. So we use whatever is needed to understand it better and to make it work better. So very theoretical, maybe on the one side and very practical on the other side. And yeah, so we use whatever techniques is needed, so control, robotics, neuroscience, etc. Um, so what we do is experiment, especially using uh, robotic interfaces to create dynamic environment, and you want to see how people react to that, how they adapt to that. And when we do not understand what we found, we do modeling to understand better. And then, of course, it, it, uh, it gives us new questions that we can test. Um, application, so assuming that it's working, voila. So yeah, so we had, for example, this first brain control wheelchair. So it was a long time ago, 10 years ago. And, and we have other application in, uh, in uh, 
and rehabilitation, which we will speak about now. So maybe if you have interested people, uh, so just to note, so we have quite a few open positions right now. So for example, to, in, to, to continue investigating the control of supernumerary limb, this is something that we are interested in. Uh, so this, so you have this guy who has six finger, and and we have investigated uh, the capabilities. And and strangely, or, or very surprisingly to us, so we found that these people are really uh, manipulation wise. They are more clever than we do. They can do more. For example, if uh, they never use two hand to to type or, or use Google Map on the on the phone. And um, okay, so this is that. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, this is one of the things we found. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so I come to my presentation today. So what I want to speak about is neuroscience-based upper limb rehabilitation. And, and with these four questions, so what technology should we use, how to design human-machine interaction, how to get ideas, and, and understanding the causes of impairment. So let's go to the first question, so what technology for rehabilitation? So uh, you all know what is a stroke, so you have a part of the brain that is uh, not uh, so the blood is not coming or it's coming uh, too much blood is coming to that area and then uh, you get you get an impairment and so this is uh, the typical treatment in the UK a few years ago I I, uh, I insist on that because nowadays so let me describe first so you have a stroke then you have you go to the hospital and and people look to stabilize your condition when your condition is stabilized then you have you have two times a day one uh, session of physical therapy and one sec session of occupational therapy so physical therapy you try to improve the function occupational therapy you try to comply basically find a way to comply to the new situation and and so that's what you have in a in a day in the good cases and uh, mostly uh, they have time to train mobility and as soon as the people are mobile so can somehow uh, walk then they have to go home and and uh, officially it is because you would make a better rehabilitation home um, non-officially it's pretty obvious that they are there's not enough money and they are not enough therapist so I think it is one of our duties to try to find also technological solution to try to to help and and to make that people can train especially the upper limb because the upper limb is often neglected in the rehabilitation. Okay, so this I'm just giving lots of stimulation to an area. Uh -oh. <laughs> and then getting to activate very specifically the hand. Can you move with me to the you see that she is and basically uh, driving across. the hand. So you're just trying to wrinkle that in. Uh, across, across, across. Rehabilitation. And, and, and so when, when you see this, I mean, when you see this uh, movement and, and this movement that has to be repeated, you think maybe it, it's possible to, to design a system that can help doing that. Okay, so the, the motivation, so you have more and more people with motor impairments, so stroke patient because we, the society is getting older, but also uh, traumatic brain injuries, so from accidents, uh, spinal cord injury is the same, uh, cerebral palsy uh, coming from, um, from preterm babies, and, and the number of preterm babies not going down, and so there. So, and, and, and the point is that patient, sorry, a patient uh, receive too little therapy and, and we know that in principle, the more therapy you have, uh, the better you will be able to control your movement. Okay, so. Is it constraint to do therapy? That's a bit on the debate right now, right? Sorry? The constraint, constraint to do movement therapy or motor therapy, you want to listen to that? That's a bit under debate right now whether it's actually really effective. Absolutely, and 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 we don't know. Also, yeah, we don't know. Uh, 
uh, how to best provide the therapy, what is intensity and so on. And I'm sure you had quite a few lectures and somebody is working on things like that I think here, yeah. Okay, um, and that's the point. So, so the optimal training technique we don't know yet and, and so this is a motivation for technology assisted rehabilitation. So one of the motivation is really that having uh, devices we can measure what is happening and try to understand and, and make it work better. As a, as a reason uh, that we can make games that can be tailored to motivate people uh, to train. Okay, so um, this is the, some of the first systems. So they had this MIT manner, so just plain our movement and, and this system where uh, so you have this hand, the movement of the non-affected hand is measured and the robot on the other hand is uh, playing what the um, healthy hand is doing. Okay, and, and it had quite a few studies for a period of over 10 years and, and this is the conclusions that were so now a long time ago, 10 years ago, but the situation is about always the same. So robot assisted therapy is about as effective as uh, uh, therapy with uh, a human therapist. And so you have an improvement, but that is limited. And what we know for sure is that passive movement is not working. And this we know from robot assisted therapy and actually therapists knew this already for, for a long time. And one thing is that so all these studies were done with planar movement and people improve, eventually improve the planar movement, but they do not improve the hand. And so they cannot uh, take objects so functionally, so practically, it doesn't help that much. So, and, and so based on that, so people try to make uh, modules, so hand modules on the, on the robotic system. And so you have three of them, but you see that it makes huge systems. So for example, this system, it was at uh, University of Reading in the hospital. And, and basically they had to dedicate a room just for this robot in the hospital, what is of course not possible uh, practically. And, and you don't even speak of home. So based on that, we, we started to, to develop a uh, relatively uh, smaller robotic system for for the hand. That's what we wanted to do. Okay, so you see this uh, this patient. So th you have this uh, robot for for the fingers. And, and basically, so when you have to close together, and, and when you do not close together, you have visual feedback showing that it's not the case, like here. And, and we had training about uh, two months, and uh, so these are some of the results. So you see that, so these are the forces of the five fingers, right? And you see that it's improving with the treatment, so it is uh, much better coordinated in the finger. And okay, so these data are not for the patient, of course not. It's not even for the therapist, but it's our role to to design from this data metrics that the therapist can can uh, can use to decide what to do. And um, okay, so this is one. This is another one because, in fact, what we found is uh, yeah, so. Gaining back the fingers is is not possible for most of the stroke patients. On the other on the other hand, simple functions so like this and and like that of the forearm, the hand, and and wrist. This uh, there is good hope that they can get something back. So we have designed uh, uh, systems a long time ago now based around the function, not not around not an exoskeleton uh, fixed to the to the body, but something based around the function. And okay, so so in this case, so the, this person is training the grasping. So the the robot is opening my hand. I should not resist, and after I have to I have to to close, but uh, smoothly. And uh, so you see, you see. So here I have the reference position. So I have to follow this smooth trajectory. 
and, and I have a lot of visual feedback to make things sensible. And um, okay, so we have metrics, so we had put precision and, and smoothness initially. After the analysis of the data, we find the most important for that is, so what makes this most difficult is to ask them to go slower. So they would normally do something like that. So like the crocodile, basically. So you can close, but it's much more difficult to open. And, and it's very difficult for them to control. So making them close, uh, not only smoothly, but slowly is making it more difficult. Um, so, the, the task is adapted according to the, so the difficulty level is adapted. So when they pass this threshold, then they go to the next difficulty level, that is to make it slower. Okay, uh, we have this as a movement. So again, so you give a lot of visual feedback. So concretely, we uh, amplify the angle of the hand so that they see really well what happens. And, um, uh, yeah, so we have also uh, scores or metrics and, and automatic adaptation of difficulty. Also, so it's more difficult to know for the, so when you have kind of reaching in, in one dimension, it's more difficult. So you make it, you can, you can try to make it more accurate and so on, but it's not so easy to give uh, a good metrics. Um, Okay, so this is a clinical study that we did. So basically, it's uh, three times one hour during six weeks. Uh, when you think about, uh, so uh, many of you probably have played an instrument and, and you know that uh, you would train to get really good results. You would train every day, of course, and, and at least half an hour. And, and, and here they have three times one hour in a week, so it's very little, actually. And... Um, Okay, so uh, they have one exercise, so let's say this, and after, so stretching, one exercise, after stretching again, and break, and after this exercise. And, um, yeah, so this is a result with this guy, so you see that he's able to improve the closing to, to, to make it much more smooth and successful, what he was not able to at the beginning. Um, this lady, so this is this movement, so you see that she's initially not able, but she's becoming able to do it and relatively smoothly. Uh, so, of course, you want to understand how it is working relatively to a functional assessment that physiotherapists are, are used to, to, to use to, um, to see what is working, what is not working. And, and so you have this uh, Fugmeier, sorry, you have this Fugmeier assessment that, uh, that is widely used and you see that the, the patient improved during the six weeks of the treatment and they maintained six weeks after. So it's positive from that. You see the improvement of Fugmeier is typically um, five or more. So this is actually the typical improvement that you find in, in therapies. And motor assessment scale, this is another scale, is also improving, and spasticity is decreasing. Spasticity, you know, this is that you, you keep uh, tight in a, in a uh, yeah, you, you have resistance against the movement. And this is something that is very common in stroke and also in SCI. And, and uh, you see that it is released a bit, maybe by, by these uh, functions that we do with the robot, that the robot is opening and you should not resist. It's kind of stretching. And this kind of thing may help um, to release plasticity. Okay, so what we found that is interesting, okay, so you have this improvement, and, and when you look at the Fuglmeier assessment, so there are different, uh, so there is a part for the hand and a part for the arm, and we train only the hand, right, but we found improvement both in the hand and in the arm, what is something important. This has been seen in a few other studies, I wouldn't say this is definitive, because this, there is definitely not enough studies about that, but it's something very interesting, because because it means, for example, that uh, you may not need to train uh, the whole arm with a complex device and so on. If you can have a simple device that can be put on the table, etc., that's something completely different from a practical point of view. Okay. So now the, on the Fugelmeier, the, the baseline 
is already relatively high, right? So, can you say something about the inclusion criteria that you um, did you select actively against people with low Fugelmeyer scores, or, or that was this is just a group you worked with? That's a group, but it had also people with relatively low. It was very homogeneous, uh, I would say. But you are definitely right that you basically um, get the result you want by selecting the people. Yeah, that's not what we did. We were not experienced enough for that, but but yes, it's possible. Again, I say so. We we got about five point. What is standard in a way? Yes, uh, I've almost every study get that. I think, yeah, the most interesting thing is the improvement in the hand and, and what's, uh, so the functional improvement. Actually, the last published study was exactly the other way around. So we train arm, yeah. we get hand improvement as well. Uh, that is surprising me. I'm happy to look at that, yeah. But what kind of movements? Uh, Just arm? Planar movements, uh, but in a okay. reality reaching grasping pads. So you have some. No, in virtual reality. What we're really mapping on yeah. the are, are the arm movements, the planar arm movements. Ah, okay, interesting. Okay, uh, so this is another system that we designed for task-oriented therapy. So this is this is so task-oriented therapy. You want to train um, a pseudo-realistic situation. So we have designed this table. You have also instrumented object and this table is uh, telling you what to do and is measuring the force. The force is a very good measure of, of the motor condition. And and um, one thing that is, so you have also collocation of visual and haptic workspace. What we think is very important is the sense that uh, it may help the transfer and, and first of all, uh, it makes that when you have this table and you do the thing on the table, you are really immersed automatically without uh, without any uh, complex virtual reality system. Um, I don't know whether, no, it had already is a bimanual. I think not. Let's see the bimanual because this is interesting. Oh, it had bimanual before? Ah, okay, so I come back because I want to explain that. Mm, voila, yeah. So this is, so you have the, you have the illustration. So you get implicit feedback, right? With this bimanual task, so it's measuring the force and the force is, is illustrated on the... You have an orthosis device also there, mounted on the screen, right? Sorry? It's also an orthosis, there's also an arm support. Yeah, uh, there oh, is an arm no, 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 there is an arm support and that's very good. And, and you probably know this arm support, what is that? Um, I cannot find out. That is a company in Delft. I mean, a spin-off of Delft University. Very good support. And in fact, when people visited our uh, center and they try the table, they are happy and so on. But they say, oh, but the support is really the great thing. And that's the only thing we have not done. <laughs> but yeah, and I agree. I mean, the support is great. Yeah. OK. Um, so. That's something that has translated to this uh, Marwa system from Taro Motion, and it seems that it's very successful. And they have developed very nice game uh, in involving also cognitive function, um, and and for children, but also for other people. Okay, we came uh, more simple and more simple. So we designed. So, so a colleague came, a, a clinical colleague came. He wants a, a handle that is compliant and very sensitive on the force. And and that's what we have created. And what is interesting, it it is used and it can really be used from the beginning. So uh, just after the stroke until home. And I don't know any other system that can really be used um, from the beginning to to home and so you have so it's based on on mobile technology so uh, tablets and so on and um, something interesting is that so the compliance when the colleague told me I want something that is measuring for that is very sensitive and that is compliant and I told him yes we can do I don't think it's important that it is compliant but we can do and and so we did and and in fact we find that the compliance is quite important 
so actually, that very simple. So you play with it. I, when I play with the thing, if it is wished, after a few minutes, I'm tired. I'm not really tired, but I feel tired. And if it is compliant, I could play for hours without, without any problem. And, and it did remind me because, so we had done a study on, on, on uh, uh, arm function of learning, on learning, and, and we had done rigid and, and compliant uh, uh, along a channel, and, and we actually found that compliant is, um, is enabling a, a better retention of the learning. So this is something that is interesting. Yeah. Sorry. Do you have any ideas why? Well, I mean, uh, so you have more sensing. It's more natural. I'm not sure actually, but yeah, but yeah. So it's interesting because because yeah, yeah. So like this device, you can make passive devices. So we have no motor, but the fact that you have uh, this compliance is probably adding something. Um, yeah. So. Conclusion of this small part, so, okay, if you see the evolution of the system, so it was done by a PhD student, uh, Alejandro Melendez, and, and so you see that there were a few systems, and, and you have more and more systems, and more and more complex. But, um, okay, so there are many questions. So the first question is, which system is really tested on patient and first on people? And, and the second question is what you really win from complex system. And it doesn't seem that you win much from complex system. At, and also we do not know yet what is really important. So, so and, and when you think of, uh, for example, when you think of exoskeletons, that, so you have also commercial product from that. So one potential advantage of exoskeleton is that you can control each joint. One disadvantage is that, okay, so I can control every joint. How do I control the joint? I don't know, etc. So, um, so what we want is, is, so maybe we don't want to make more complex systems. We may want to make more simple systems. And, and for that, uh, we, I, I think it's important to do experiment and, and to look at new science and, and try to find new science a uh, shortcut to, to find a way to make system efficient to look what is really important. Voila. So this is for for this part. Uh, any questions? Yeah, so you can yeah please cut me every time you want. But now for for this first part, so you, you give us sort of an overview of the different systems you built, right? This is was, yeah. But now, what are the underlying principles that make them effective in your mind? Um, because it's something you, you just showed the phenomena, right? mm -hmm. but what, what are the underlying design principles that you think make them effective? Okay, so as a really un underlying principle, I don't know. What I know, on the other hand, is that for each of these systems, we did first a study uh, to see what would be the possibilities and what would be the best uh, tool for that. Now to come really with what is the um, newer science reason for this and that, I, I think it's a bit premature. I mean, we, we, we will come to that exactly now, so we can address some of the question, but uh, I prefer to have a, a very pragmatic approach in the design of the system. There are, there are some, some things. So for example, this table, uh, we very consciously made that you have visual and haptic workspace at the same place. So this is one of the principles. Um, so we pick principles like that. But we don't pick a big new science model for that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So collocation is one thing. Um, of course, we consider. I mean, uh, the obvious thing. We consider the biomechanics of the people. Uh, uh, we consider, of course, also the safety. So you make you make mechanical stop, for example, so that people cannot be damaged. So this this kind of thing we consider. Um, yeah. So 
one question is, is how should Wabat be controlled to promote efficient rehabilitation? And, and we don't know. So we, we first have to understand what is a physical interaction between people. And, and so this is something that uh, we started to do uh, 10 years ago. So now, so if you consider uh, the current system for rehabilitation, so normally the movement with robots, the movement is constrained along a path, you have a fixed control law, you don't know about the interaction stability, and, and the tasks are always collaborative. And however, so the movement is controlled along the path, but we know that natural movement have a lot of variability. Why should we get rid of that, especially because learning must involve some kind of exploration, right? That can come from this, this variability. Um, yeah, so there's a fixed control law while we know that therapists would adapt the, the, the guidance, the assistance. Um, Interaction stability, of course, this is important just for safety to start with. And, and, uh, yeah, so we want, we want to, to have different, uh, interactions. So maybe some competition to, to, uh, to challenge the people or any other condition. So, so we want a system that is stable and safe, smooth movement, but able to, uh, give large forces if necessary. Um, we want something that is guided but not constraining, able to react to the patient, adapted to the patient condition, and versatile so to uh, to be able to to make different kind of interaction. So, but so first we want to understand how human control interaction. So for that uh, we oh uh, okay. Okay, so we used, we used the system like that. So you have two people, uh, each with his computer, so it's his robot, and the robot can be connected in any way, right? So you have these two people, and, and they interact together via the robot. And, and because you have the robot, you can change the interaction. So for example, I can make that I'm connected with you, but you are not connected with me. Or we can sh uh, change the strengths of the interaction. And, and so we have, we have a, a task that is, so we use a task that is a tracking task. So you see this uh, red target and you have to follow with your hand, right? So you have this red target and, and you follow. And it's moving randomly. And in fact, the two of them have the same. The two of them come at the same time in the womb and have to do the same task, but they don't know. And, um, okay. And so we did this with about, uh, 100 subjects, so they have uh, to follow for one minute, and after they have to follow connected, so connected with an elastic band between the two hands, and after they do this alone, and after connected, and after alone, etc. And and so when you ask them, so we ask to these 100 people, so what was this force? Because they feel a force. We ask them, what was this force? And And they have no idea. They, they, they really have no idea. The most that people told was, oh, yeah, I know. You, we code in my force and you play it again. But of course, it's something very different because it would, it's not a real time interaction, right? And they think that it's disturbing them, but it is helping them. We can see that. So, okay, so, um, yeah. So you, you see that. So, we plot his improvement, so the difference between uh, tracking when I'm connected and tracking when I'm not connecting, so the tracking error. And I put this as a function of how much better the partner is when we are not connected. So he's a partner is better, he, I am better, okay? And we see that, okay, so the, the tracking is improving when I'm connected with a better partner, this is logical. I'm I'm winning by working with a better partner. What is much less logical is that I'm also winning by interacting with a worse partner, right? So that's something that is very strange. So I can win by by working with a, a better partner and also with a worse partner. And if we have just a mechanical connection, so for example, if we have haptic guidance, we see that 
then we have a, a, a zero-sum game. So I'm, I would win with a better, but lose with a worse. So this is the normal interaction. But by human, it is different. So when they are connected, they, they can learn from each other somehow. And uh, so now, so we, we try to understand. So we did a lot of uh, computational modeling. And, and so, for example, we modeled the mechanical interaction, just the mechanical interaction. And then if you, if you do just the mechanical interaction, you have again a, a zero sum game, right? But with human, you have something banded like that. And the model that we found is, is correct, is doing the, the correct prediction, is uh, a crazy idea that, OK, so if I'm connected with you, uh, first, I don't realize, people don't realize they are connected. But somehow my brain realizes that the force with you is connected to my task. And my brain automatically make a model of your motor function so that I'm becoming able to get your eyes and my eyes together. And then I can be more accurate. And the same for you. You would automatically understand that uh, the force you get from me is related to the task. And you would make a model of myself. And you have these two pairs of eyes. And when we simulate that, when we simulate that, we find we find something similar, and but simulation is not enough. So we put in the robot. So we did experiment with the robot. The robot having this identification of the partner, identification of the sensory motor function, and then we get uh, a, a perfect match uh, between. So this is the same to interact with a, a robot partner and to interact with a human. So from that, we understand that. A human make a model of the partner and, and they use it to improve the, uh, they can use it to improve the own performance. And, and so it's uh, logical to imagine that when you have therapies and the same, the therapist and uh, make a model of the patient and, and, and use it somehow to, to adapt the therapy. Now the robot movements are they are smooth, or can you also have jerky movements? That's a very good point. Uh, because, so we did smooth movements, so yeah, you know, uh, we did, uh, yeah, so it's, uh, we use uh, things like optimal control and so on, so it's all smooth. And later we did another study where we compare, we let people compare uh, interaction with a human interaction with this robot partner and haptic guidance, trajectory guidance. And basically, um, the interaction with a human is working best in terms of learning. With a robotic partner, it's also good. With haptic guidance, it's not good. But people prefer the trajectory tracking and the robotic guidance to the human. And, and why they prefer, we find by questionnaires that it's very likely that they find the human uh, too unpredictable. And, uh, for example, the human has shock and, and so on. So, yeah, so, so that's something, but we don't, we really first wanted to understand what is happening. And from that, we understand that people really identify the partner. But we are developing something, some kind of uh, Turing test with a, with a perfectly human stuff. I'm not sure how useful it is, but it's interesting to see what, what makes a human really human. <coughs> so we catch this uh, property of identifying the partner, but the jerk and uh, what is this jerk and so on, this we don't have yet. And yeah. Let me try to do the Okay, so one, one more point is the learning is not due to noise. This we know. Because we have tested only noise and it doesn't it doesn't make one thing to consider to have yoke control where you have a human human trajectory, human generated trajectories that you start to distort. Like you start to add a delay or you start to sort of time warp them to see what's this range in which it would still be accepted as being plausible and where it, where it will break down. So what makes the human movement really human? If you consider that like yoke control. So we, yeah, so we, we have identified some uh, systematic partner of the human and, and that's what we try to put in now to see. Okay. But yeah. Uh, 
Um, something that may be interested, so when you do the experiment with a human, and instead of having a, um, a, a spring with, with, stiff, uh, with the forces like that, so a normal spring, you put a repelling spring. And then, of course, because you have something that is repelling, the uh, tracking area is uh, larger. However, after that, people have learned from that. that that's something interesting. So, yeah. So, yeah, it seems, yeah, really, it seems that the brain is able to understand what happens and to identify like a, a good identification uh, algorithm. And so, in a way, it is stupid, right? So, because basically it seems that all what you could identify with an algorithm, the human can do. That's, uh, that's very strange. Okay. Um, okay, so now, so let's go to the robot. So we, uh, we can consider the robot and its human user as two interacting agents and, and to, yeah, so we want to design the control so we can uh, consider that uh, each of these agents, so the robot and the human, um, move according to some cost function and, and, uh, and, and then we use control theory to, to, to get a safe, reactive and adaptive interaction behavior. And, and most importantly, we, we use this identification of the partner. And, and so we develop this systematically, so using control theory. So you have, uh, okay, so you have the, the, the forces to move uh, the object or the hand, and, uh, and of course it is driven by the robot and the human. You can, you can linearize that by imposing some uh, mechanical impedance. Um, so you get a linear system again. So this is the robot and the human driving the system, um, and 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 you see the task. So the task is to reach this target. Uh, can be in a trajectory, but it's to reach this target or to follow this target. And uh, and and so this is a reaching task. And and so you have reaching task. So if you are alone to do that, or if the robot is alone to do that, the the solution. Oh. I really have problem. You have a better, yeah, yeah. And this one, I have to. The battery is out. I think. Okay, I continue a bit. So, so if you have if you have this uh, this task, so this switching task with this cost function, so this is to which uh, to which the target with minimal effort then the solution as you know from optimal control this is this is the LQR solution now if you want to consider the partner so if the robot thank you if the robot yeah if the robot has to um was uh, ah voila <laughs> okay <sighs> Mm -mm. Maybe it was the wrong thing. No, thank you. Okay, so uh, so this is the solution that you have when the robot is working alone, not considering the the patient. Now, so if you okay, so look at this. So if you if you make that the robot is considering itself, but also considering the the user, the human user, right? So the human user has also to reach the target and to minimize uh, his or her cost. And then you have this Nash solution. So this is differential game theory. This is not something that we invented. This is something that we use. So, so you see that it's similar like before. So you have also that the motor command is a, is a linear function of the, of the state. And, and this uh, gain, this gain you can compute from uh, so-called Riccati equation. Now what is different is that the, the state matrix, the transition matrix is no longer the A, but it is the A minus the partner. And, and this is great because uh, this, this linear 
differential game theory is, is so so clear and so intuitive in a way. You see that so for the robot this is there's a state matrix minus the human, and for the human, it is a state matrix minus the robot, right? So you have this coupling, you have this coupling to the the state uh, equation, and okay, so so this is this is just game theory, differential game theory. Now what we did is that, of course, so if you have the robot, the robot doesn't know the human, or if you interact with another human, you can also not know. What is a human? So you have to identify the partner, and and that that what we do. So we developed we developed this technique to identify the partner. So uh, you can. So what you do is you you set a Lyapunov function so that is minimizing the error to the target, and and minimizing the gain error, and and then when you want to minimize this cost function. Then you get this adaptation law, this relatively simple uh, adaptation law, and uh, using uh, so this uh, nonlinear control theory, you can find a solution that is uh, converging, that is stable all the way, uh, that is bounded even if the human is not behaving uh, according to game theory, and and so there are many advantages of of using this. Analytical way, and uh, so this is a simulation. So this is for a movement uh, back and forth, right? So you have a movement back and forth, and 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 so you see that the game theory controller is going back and forth, and and so the dots are the real gain, and you see that uh, relatively soon the controller is is following, so getting the real value. You see that now. What is interesting? So, if you use two independent controllers, so the the, the robot independent from the from the human and the human independent from the robot, so this is using LQR solution, right? And then you see that you can also succeed, but with high gain because you cannot optimally tune your effort because you don't know the partner. There are also stability problem. With uh, uh, so the independent solutions that I don't show here. Okay, so now some experiments so with uh, with uh, this guy who played three different conditions. So when you have no interaction, so he's not taking the robot. Then you see, so the movement is successful. You see that the robot is understanding. So this is the red line. The robot is understanding that there is no. Um, Nothing coming from the human, and then the robot is automatically uh, providing the suitable assistance. The same when it is weak. So when when the human is weak, then the robot is understanding that and adapting. And and when the human is is healthy, so doing his task, then the robot understands that the human is doing the task, and then the robot is automatically. Uh, decreasing assistance to the point that it's coming to make competition, so breaking the movement, so so as to make the task more challenging. And and why why can the robot do that? Why can the robot assist uh, optimally? It's because the robot has identified the cost function of the human, and identifying the cost function of the human, it can compute its own cost. That that's the thing. So it's all coming because. So the robot is identifying the human. These are uh, trial with um, with patients. So just to show that you keep the normal viability of of the movement. This is uh, very preliminary, so it's not it's not a study, but it's just to show that you keep the motion viability and and you have stable movement as well. Okay, so to to make a, a summary of this part, so this is about human robot interaction. So what do you have? What do we have for human robot interaction? So we have teleoperation that is master slave. We have also master slave for uh, exoskeleton. So if I'm if I want to if I'm a, a, a frail person, I want to amplify my forces. So I want to understand my forces and and make them larger. Uh, on the other hand, you have assistive devices that work independently 
on what the human is doing. So if you see this commercial device, so it is supporting gravity while the worker is positioning the thing. And when you see them working together, you have the impression they work actually together, they collaborate, but they don't. Uh, each of them is doing its task, and, and that's the way it's working. So uh, no one of these schemes uh, is using uh, a real collaboration between the two. And, and if you, so if you want uh, to design versatile interactions, so you can do this using this game theory, so you can do uh, rehabilitation, what we have seen, you can do uh, you can use this kind of thing for shared driving. That's something we uh, are going uh, into. And, and you have also the possibility to make things like competition. It's not very clear uh, how to use competition actually right now. But the important point is that you can do that really only because the robot understands. So it's identifying the patient or the user, and, and then when the robot understands the user, it can adapt uh, in some way. It can choose a way to adapt, choose a strategy. Now, um, yeah, so I skip that. So this is not mechanical interaction yet, but let's consider this. So this is a game between these two. So she is really a patient. This is a, this is a therapist. And they have this grippable device, and and so when I press my device, the balloon is going up, right? That was my fault. And and it it's the game is done in a way that, okay, she is bad, but he can help stabilize the, the plank, and then uh, then she has the impression she is better as she is, and she can play longer, and and then she is motivated to play longer, and and then from that, she should improve more. Um, what is interesting also is that conversely, so think about the grandson wanted to help the grandmother, but it's a bit boring to play, right? Because he's normally too good. But because, because the stroke patient is, is bad, it makes the game more difficult and then more difficult, so more challenging, so more interesting. So the game is conceived in a way that you have people of very different level who can play together. So it can be the stroke patient and somebody of the family. It can also be two stroke patients because every patient will have a completely different condition. And uh, so these are two patients. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's go down. Mm -hmm. You go down, let release. Yeah. And then up. Yeah. Oh, that's it. That's it. Up, up. Up, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's it. That's yeah. it. You up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you see that they yeah. obviously they enjoy the game, and and so we want to use um, the social aspect uh, for motivation. But for that you have yeah you have to make games so that they can really play together with different level and, and, and in a way that they can continue the game and uh, yeah, be challenged and so on. Uh, again, so we don't have mechanical connection here yet. Uh, we don't know how much it would improve or not, but that's something to, to go into. So yeah, this is a bit and saying your question of before, so we try to, to understand the interaction and how you can really improve or make the principle you can. I don't think, um, yeah, I don't see practically the connection to really uh, brain information and so on at this point for practical rehabilitation. Okay, how to get ideas? Um, so just to present you a, a course that we have that we have created. So it is this uh, HCAD course, meaning Human Center Design of Assistive Day Rehabilitation Devices. So what it is, it's uh, so you have a student from different departments and, and they come together and um, they have lectures with clinical partners. And I don't know about stroke, about epilepsy, about Parkinson's disease. So basically clinical collaborators. And, um, and, and then, so they have these lectures for about three weeks. And after that, 
they have to form group with people from different departments. This is the only constraint. So people from different departments in each group. And they have to come up with an idea of a device uh, for rehabilitation or assistance. And after they have to do it, and they have very few weeks to do it, and, and they, uh, they have to come with a system. And at the end, there is a competition. And uh, so comparing the design and, and, and performance. And um, yeah, so you have courses at the beginning, so work, etc. Uh, the final competition. So let me uh, find the video here. Um, yeah. <laughs> so this was at the competition. It's a long time ago now. Yeah, so you have orientation, you have sensors here to, so this is for cerebral palsy to train this or that. And very simple games, they have taken games that exist and, and have adapted that. You can never take a game one to one, you should take games, but you should adapt them to the, to the motor company. <coughs> so this one was the winner of that year. And, uh, so what do you do here? Let's see you this one. one to get cold. Uh oh. Yeah, this is oh, so yeah, I've got the shield. <laughs> okay, so let's see this one. So you see this uh, very good idea. So you have just a ball uh, supporting the hand. You have the fingers. You have force sensing at each finger and and uh, um, vibrators or stimulator at each finger. And, and so you can train the fingers and you can train also the wrist, all in a very simple system. And uh, what is interesting in, is a few years later, uh, of course it was not planned like that, but you have this company in your Phoenix uh, that has developed uh, basically, basically exactly that. Uh, so these are ex-students, not from that year, but from another year, but they they found this idea good, and and so they develop. Um, in you're, two. You're also part of the company or not? Sorry. You're also part of Dura Phoenix or not? I'm I'm advisor of that company, but I will have to quit because uh, somehow it is, it's starting to make uh, competition with the Gripable company because not on the device but on the market, at the same market. So so far I was in both, and it had no problem. But slowly it's becoming difficult, so I will quit uh, the one I'm less home. Uh, it's not that I prefer one, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, so ideally I would like that they merge or something like that. Though, but. Anyway, so in 2013, we, uh, we put a team, Cerebral Palsy. And, and so the thing is that, uh, so for example, if you see this guy, so you see this guy, so the left hand is working well, and the right hand doesn't seem to do much. And, and uh, so what we want, uh, so you have to think about that, that Cerebral Palsy, so it's congenital. So they never learn to use uh, the two hands together, and, and they have no model for the bad hand. So we want them to use the two hands together, and uh, if possible, in a good way. And so that's what we gave for task to the student, and, and so the student came with different solution, but this was the winner. So in simple cube, and, and the sizing in a way that you cannot take with one hand, and and actually, it's a good interface, can be used for many things. And um, again, let's, let's see the, the video. So that was the presentation at this competition. So, uh, so you see how it's working. So again, the, the game, you know it, but it had to be modified. Because if you take the initial game, uh, they have too much pressure to do something, and they would get uh, spasticity. So in this in this way, the patient has the control over the time. And yeah, so it is done in a way that you cannot do that. It doesn't make anything. Only so you have four sensors and an, uh, an IMU, and, and then you can find when it is doing this different from using only one hand. Okay. 
can be used in different ways. Okay. So this is uh, hard to find ideas, basically. So by, I find it's a good way to find ideas to collaborate with clinical partners, of course, and on project from students. Because if you go to the clinical partners, first the clinical partner has no time. You don't have much time either. And you don't find ideas. And, and by having student project like that, you have to, f so they find ideas. They are very creative, the student normally. And, and, and also around that, you can find ideas. And in fact, because of this course, it, it happened a few collaborations that I didn't have because we started like that and, and we found something is interesting so we can continue pursue, et cetera. Now, uh, so using robotics to understand causes of impairment. So uh, let's take an example for, okay, so cerebral palsy uh, comes uh, or is, is not caused, but is, so you have more cerebral palsy from uh, in, in preterm, in, in babies born preterm. So you have, uh, so you have about, um, I don't remember, about one in 500 uh, preterm, maybe more than that, I think. Uh, I don't remember, sorry. But what is sure is that the number of preterm infant does not decrease uh, basically because uh, women have children later and later in life. And, and so, uh, unfortunately, we are not able to decrease the number of, of preterm babies. Uh, the, the treatment is improving, but still uh, we, we don't, overall, we don't improve the whole. So we have um, about, and, and we have about 10% of babies born uh, preterm who develop cerebral palsy, so it's some um, sensory motor impairments. Okay, and, and what we think is that, so we want to understand the brain development and, and to detect when there is a problem as early as possible. And so I'm working with people from uh, neonatal medicine at King's College. And so we developed uh, so technique with MRI, so fMRI, functional MRI, and, and a robot, a robot that is MRI compatible to get reproducible condition, to get very clear condition and to try to understand really well what is, uh, so where you have a problem in the brain, what exactly it is, etc. So you see here the, the progression of the brain size and of course uh, the brain connection evolved a lot uh, during the, so from the birth at five or six months to, uh, to the term age of nine months. Uh, so this is uh, this is the, the system. So you have the scanner, and and you have to synchronize your signals. So this robot, you have to synchronize with uh, with the scanner. And so this is one of these uh, robots. So a preterm baby, the size is is the size of my hand, and the size of their hand is one phalange of my of my hand. So it's very very small and very fragile, and so you have to make a system that is, uh, yeah, that is very safe and of course MI compatible, so no ferromagnetic material and so on. Not even, man uh, yeah. So it's it's and it's coming very close to the magnetic ball, so it's it has to be really perfectly compatible. We have a, a, a pneumatic connection, so all the electronics is outside of the MI uh, scanner room, and and so we uh, transmit, uh, so we have, a, um, so the pneumatic system outside and, and transmitting the air and, and then moving the, the s a small piston that we have uh, somewhere here. Uh, I don't see it here, but yeah, here you have the piston. Okay, uh, we have sensing about the angle with uh, uh, an optical fiber. We cut the optical fiber and then when you have a big angle, more of the light is going out and from that you can measure the angle. Um, okay, so we can measure, so we have the robot moving and, and you measure the brain activity and you find activity in the sensory cortex as expected. And if you want to have uh, voluntary movement, so you just ask the baby to move and the baby is moving. 
not quite. Eh? Uh, so we wait, the babies have spontaneous movement about 10 times in an hour, and you wait for that, and you measure uh, brain activity at that point, and, and you get, as expected, activity in the, in the motor cortex. Now, so this is one strategy that we did. So you have uh, evolution of brain activity from six to nine months, basically. Uh, so you see many things. I, I don't want to go into the detail, but you have first uh, contralateral activity to the, to the moved uh, uh, wrists, and then you have uh, ipsilateral activity and an establishment of the connectivity between the two uh, the two half is the two hemispheres, and and we can study this uh, yeah this establishment of connectivity that is quite important. So it seems that in the third trimester of a gestation, you have especially this formation of connectivity, and and so that why uh, cerebral palsy uh, children often have problem for the um, bimanual operation. Connections that you want to Sorry. Colossal connections that connect to hemispheres are the main diagnostic target. Yeah. 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 They have. Um, yeah. So you have you have really uh, strange connections that are built by cerebral palsy, and you can detect, and it makes problem for yeah for taking object and so on. But that happens in which of these periods? What sort of the most critical period here in terms of uh, dismiss wiring of the brain in the cerebral palsy kids. Could it happen anywhere in this period from 31 weeks to... Oh, well, it happens, it happens especially here and, and close to term, close to term, conversely, it seems that you have some pruning of activity, kind of concentration on the useful connection, probably. So it's happening especially here, yeah. And then the main diagnostic task is the passive movement of the wrist. Now it's only that, yeah. Okay. yeah. And for this paper, so for this it is only passive movement. In the same uh, study, we did study uh, voluntary movement, but it's not in that, in, in that figure. Yeah. yeah well, the question, uh, if there is early rehabilitation, okay. if there is early rehabilitation with this uh, implant, um, is there recuperation of uh, nerve connections, for instance, transcalosal has been observed? Any plasticity in this direction? Well, what we see, what we see, I, I don't see here, but what we see also is that, uh, so compared to term babies, it seems that the um, babies born preterm have actually more connection. So the fact that, uh, so the a stimuli from being outside uh, may help the connection. Now, whether it's positive or negative, you cannot uh, interpret just for that. Okay, so another study, so we could, uh, so when you take, it seems that when you take uh, chicken, it seems that at two thirds of the gestation, the cortical representation is not clear yet. So we didn't know, and, and, and from some of our um, data, we didn't know whether you have, uh, what is uh, cortical organization, whether you have already cortical organization for uh, babies at, at six months. And, and so we did this study, so we have uh, two ankle interface, two um, the two wrist interfaces and, and one for the mouse, because of course the mouse is quite important for, for babies. And, and we found the quite boring thing, basically, is that you have seemingly uh, the homunculus of adults, but again, we didn't know. We, we, we didn't know, we didn't think we would find exactly or, or something pretty close to the adult's homunculus in, in this uh, preterm baby, so meaning also that if you have uh, an accident after the six months, then you may be able to improve uh, something, but you will not be able to change the cortical organization fundamentally. It's already too late. Um, okay, so it's about that. So to summarize, so uh, 
a neuroscience-based rehabilitation. What I mean by that is that so we want to use um, experiment to understand the causes and opportunities. What I didn't speak about is um, computational uh, neural rehabilitation with um, uh, with modeling techniques that. Uh, we work also in that, but there are people working more than us currently, maybe. Uh, so, uh, but that's something that I think is quite important. So also to try with modeling and experiment to try to understand, to use this, uh, this uh, computational neuroscience techniques that have been developed over the last 30 years for, uh, to, to focus on, on impairments. Um, on that, I want to say something is that uh, we have a problem with modeling is that all the modeling or most of the modeling in motor control is based on some averaging. And, and averaging may be correct for us because um, even if you are younger than me, we have, I guess, about the same motor control. But when it comes to patients, this is completely wrong. So you cannot make an average. You can, but it's not it's not valid. Every patient is different. And so I think we have to find already the mathematics for that, because we don't have even the mathematics. All the mathematics we have are based on averaging. <coughs> so I think that's the main issue for, for computational rehabilitation. Now, what technology for rehabilitation? Uh, I would propose solution for home and simple set settings so that you can do practically rehabilitation and, and you get a sufficiently large sets of, of devices and, and so data to try to uh, starting to understand what is not working, what is working. Um, how to design human machine interactions? So I would propose neuroscience based solutions. So making neuroscience experiment and modeling to understand what is working as we try to do with this uh, game theory framework and how to get ideas. So interaction with clinician and student around project, as I told before. And um, I'm waiting for your question. Great. <clears throat>